Uh, can we just show this? Uh, yeah, or if you have them on your laptop. Zero minutes. If you do the laptop. Uh, welcome to Six Men. Let's get uh, started. Welcome, or bonjour, I think is what I'm supposed to start with. Welcome to Montreal. Um, uh, it's a six man session. We have um, the, let's see, we have session today, and we also have a second longer session on Thursday afternoon. Um, here is the note well, which you should note well. I'm sure we've all memorized this. Oh, wait, we have a problem. Yeah, this is the problem of if you kick the uh, HMI converter, it stops working. Just continue, Bob. Okay. <laughs> There we go. So now you can note well. Um, we have Barbara and Peng doing Minute Taker and JavaScript. There's all the links. So um, going over the agenda, um, we're doing the intro and document status. Um, we have two working group items. Um, we have area director comments on the SRH draft, which Darren will be going through briefly. Um, we have Tom Herbert's ICMP errors draft, which we'll discuss, um, which we have the uh, next following with the path MTU hop by hop option. And then we have two individual drafts that Pascal is presenting. And this is the agenda for Thursday, a short introduction. Um, and we have a lot more talks, many of them short. Um, we have a review of the RFC 8200 fragmentation errata. Um, we have discovering PREF 64 and router advertisements. Um, so we, we for, for today's agenda, we may, this may end up going quicker, so we may move some of the other talks up, but we'll see how it goes. Um, and then we have Ron's, um, oh no, we have a proposal to change RFC 2675 jumbograms to historic, and then we have Ron's SRV6 plus draft, and we've asked him to basically just not get into the details, but talk about overview and motivation. And then we have um, a whole bunch of short talks that um, were new work and, you know, most of them are spring related um, that we're going to try to get to both today and Thursday. If we have time, we'll do these. So. All right. And for the document status, uh, since the last ITF in Prague, um, no published RFCs, nothing in the RFC editor queue yet, but we managed to get the SRH base document to the IESG, which is on the session coming up just after this. Um, and we have 
after much deliberation, um, ended up parking the router advertisement IP6 only flag. Um, do you have a comment, Jen? Yeah, I just want to say that this is really disappointing because now I'm totally confused how we are going to incrementally deploy V6 only networks. So I suggest people might, who are against it might think about the possible deployment model. Because now when we decide that, that we don't, do not want to have explicit signal in the network, we might end up with some implicit signal, which is probably not a good idea. Right. And, and as I said on the mailing list, I found this uh, call to be difficult to make. Um, you know, I, well, our AD, I was going to say that, you know, come and talk to, to me and the AD. The AD is at the microphone. So, Suresh, please. Yeah, uh, serious question. Uh, so, like, uh, Ola and I talked quite a bit about this. Like, uh, so, there's no consensus to advance this. Doesn't mean it's a bad idea or anything, right? So, it's just that um, there's, like, set of compromise to be made because there's, like, quite a bit of operator feedback saying this is, like, actively harmful to them, right? And there's, like, there's positive points and negative points. It's just that we couldn't find consensus to advance, right? If, if like, maybe a year from now things changes, like, you know, we could bring this back and talk about it, right? Or s something materially changes that will change people's minds on this. Like, I, I know you're disappointed, Jen, but like it's the only read of the consensus like uh, Ola and I could do on this. And of course you can appeal this decision, right? And there's a process of that, but you know, <laughs> yes, it, it was certainly hard and I'm not, I'm not happy with the outcome either, but that, that was you know, where it seemed like the community wanted to go. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks, Suresh. Uh, document status two, we have three working group documents. We have the ICMP errors, it's on the agenda for today. Uh, we have the privacy extension update that's in review. I think we have two reviews and we heard from one. So I'll, I'll follow up that uh, this week and, and post an update on the mailing list. Uh, and then we have the discovering uh, slash 64 or NAT64 prefixes in root for advertisements, which is either on by the end of today or uh, for Thursday. Um, we have two ongoing reviews from other working groups. Um, the IP Wave one, I think we're pretty much done with. Um, that's going on in IP Wave. Um, there's been quite a lot of back and forth on that one with regards to prefix lengths and so on. Um, and from 6Low, we, we just received the IPv6 Backbone Router uh, document for review. Uh, Tim Winters have graciously accepted with a little bit of um, <laughs> nudging, I accepted to review that. If there's anyone else who would like to review that document, you know, please raise your hand or, or let the chairs know. Um, it's reasonably urgently, so we'd like to have a review in, in you know, a, a week or two for that one. Uh, okay, so uh, the next topic is uh, AD comments on the SRH base document. Uh, we have no slides on that, but Darren will, will bring up the, the, the email from our beloved AD. There you are. Let's see if that works. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Okay. Good morning, or afternoon, evening. It's evening now, isn't it? Okay. Here we go. Um, all right. So. Last IETF, uh, we completed our last call. We've gone to review now. Suresh, uh, last week, at the end of the week, had come up with um, uh, uh, with uh, his review comments. And uh, we've gone over those. I, I'm, I'm still getting them completed. Um, so what we're going to do is just talk about the issues that Suresh Rose uh, Ray, Risen had, had brought forward, I think that's the right word, um, and how we're going to resolve those. Uh, and at the end of that, if anyone has comments, you're welcome to come up. All right, the first one, and I'm going to read from down here. Um, <clears throat> so TLVs are present when the header extension length exceeds the last entry element in the segments list, and uh, Suresh points out that this doesn't, uh, doesn't sound right. 
Um, I think we can fix this with a bit of math, uh, describing exactly how an implementation would be able to identify uh, when TLVs are present. Uh, so I'll add that in and that'll go out to the list. Section 2.1, what's the purpose of being able to include an HMAC TLV with the key ID uh, set to zero since there'll be no HMAC? Um, that's been in the draft for quite some time and I'm gonna leave that as to be determined uh, because I have to go back and uh, see what the original intent was around that. Section 2.1.2.2, where the SRH implementations uh, can support multiple hash functions but must implement SHA-2 in the SHA-2.6 variant. Um, uh, the belief was that that must level requirement was, uh, was a little too much. And there's an easy fix here to just qualify that text to say that, well, implementations that do support the HMAC must support this uh, SHA-256. Pasted some old text in here for uh, section 5.3 where there's an ask for more descriptive um, uh, more descriptive text around the MTU considerations. Uh, and I think what really needs to go in here is just simply stating that uh, the SR source node encapsulates in, uh, uh, a packet that's traversing an SR domain. Um, and because of that encapsulation, um, the edges of the SR domain need to consider MTU. And that text will be sent out to the list something along those lines. Now, these are our, our minor comments here. Most of these Suresh has provided uh, text for us. So these will go relatively quickly. Um, there's a, a comment here saying that uh, RFC 8200 doesn't actually talk about mutability, and, and we did talk about this within the working group uh, quite a bit. Um, I think the fix here is going to be uh, mentioning that, well, RFC 8200 doesn't explicitly state anything about mutability, that it does allude to it, uh, in section 4.4. Um, I think that'll be our, our resolution to, to this particular question. I know we had a lot of comment around this text and a lot of uh, work on it in the working group. Uh, go ahead, Suresh, you had other yeah, thoughts? Sorry, so like the, my suggested uh, way of going forward with this was saying that um, based on the constraints specified in section 404 of 8200, like no insertion, da, 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 right? Mm -hmm. uh, these fields are immutable. So that that means that people are not looking for the mutability text in right. 200, and that's that should be a good way forward, I think. Right. Okay. Um, he's offered. Oops. Let's cancel this here. In section two one. Um, I think we should also mention that padding TLVs are used for alignment of TLVs themselves, something along the lines of the new text that was provided. Uh, this looks this looks okay to me, and that's uh, obviously the intention of uh, like padding TLVs is to is to align the TLVs. So uh, that should be good to go. Section two one two one. Was this one text in the beginning is real? Ah, okay, this is this is in reference to the text in the HMAC uh, HMAC field. Um, and I don't have the final text for this yet, but uh, some, some new text, uh, uh, some, uh, I shouldn't say text because I'm over overusing that word now, a new sentence describing um, that, uh, well, describing this alternate composition without using the word text is what we'll use to, uh, to fix this particular issue. Uh, section 5.4. Uh, the zeroist segment uh, doesn't seem very obvious. Some new text is uh, is suggested here, so we'll just take that new uh, that new text as is. And then on the editorial section, he's got some suggestions around uh, uh, segment routing to be applied to the V6 data plane using a new type of routing extension header. He's got a fix up there, and that text looks fine. And another fix up in the uh, uh, in the last comment here as well, uh, just some reordering there, and I don't see anything wrong with that either. Looks pretty straightforward. So once uh, once I get the alterations done, we'll send them out to the list and uh, then release a new version of the draft.
Thanks, Rush. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, uh, so, Rish Krishna. So, like, send, send your fixes to the list and publish yeah. a new version, and I'll send it off to ITF last call, and then just follow the process afterwards. Like, you know, look at the directories and ISG, yeah. and hopefully uh, we'll get this done quickly. Yes, thanks. definitely. Cool. Thanks, man. All, right. All right. Thanks. Please give me the dongle. I'll give you the. So, Tom Herbert, I think you are up. There you go. Something happens. We're in display. I wanted to turn the mirroring back on again. Are you a Chromebook fan? The chair AV enthusiasm is limited to powering things back up and down again. If if Mead Echo is listening, could you send the AV people, please? I mean, it doesn't show up. That's the way it is. from my No problem. Perhaps it should be there, but I need to be 60. I'm sure that. I'm sure there's IPv6 over the HDMI cable. Don't plug you in. Well, hang on. So here's that. Um, we knew that we used a different laptop on that one. And when we plug it back in again, it doesn't get her point. It's free. And we tried to read between the HDMI merger. <laughs> So I have it, the slides up here as well. Yeah. Yeah. We can try it. Anyway. Anyway. It, can, it works on a Mac Uh-oh, so it's not that. No. Does something happen with the driver cable right? Yeah, it's like that. It's like a network problem. <laughs> you want to start? Talking without the slides. Mm -hmm. 
I can start if you want. Let's look at that the other one. If that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we just go with that? Yeah. Should we just go with this one? Yeah, if you want, so it's just that the problem was that there was a cable that was unplugged down here. So you can transfer this. It should work over here as well. Okay. Get rid of this for now. Okay. Let's try that. This is your job. Just make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Ice cream in the main. Thank you. Okay, so there must be a good joke in there somewhere, but kind of late in the day, so I won't even try. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit, hopefully this will be brief, about uh, ICMP v6 errors for discarding packets. This is a working group draft. A uh, little, Just a little bit of overview. So the idea is that um, we want some ICMP errors that host and middle boxes can send when they drop packets um, for uh, exceeding limits, particularly in processing extension headers. So this defines four new parameter problem codes. It extends applicability of one parameter problem code and one new destination unreachable code. The parameter problem codes, uh, one, the general parameter problem is used um, for middle boxes now as opposed to just host. So if a middle box drops a packet uh, for next header unknown, um, the slide probably wrong, for next header unknown, then the middle box can actually send that message. Four, five, six, and seven, uh, the new proposed codes for parameter problems, uh, deal with extension headers. So extension header too big, this can either be a number, I think that one's number of bytes, extension header chain too long, so the sum total of extension headers exceeds some processing limit. Too many options in extension header. This is simply a, a limit of the number of options. And options too big. This is actually a, a later addition, so a particular option exceeds some limit. So that last one, uh, we also apply to the number of consecutive pads exceeding uh, seven. So we have some other, two other changes, as I mentioned. We extend the applicability of parameter problem code one, unrecognized header type to allow intermediate nodes to send. And we add it new destination unreachable code um, parameter num uh, number eight, which is headers too long for applicability of, um, to apply to the situation where the sum total of headers, not just extension headers, may exceed the processing limit of a device. So this might be useful, for instance, in a device that has a, a parsing header limit, and if that's exceeded, it ends up dropping the packet, so it'd be nice to know that happened. So there's three versions of the draft. Uh, Suresh, you have a question? Yeah, I do, actually. Uh, for, uh, Suresh Krishnan, so for the unrecognized next header drive, right, like are we somehow changing um, the assumption that intermediate nodes don't look past the uh, unrecognized next headers because they only require to look at a few that's different in the RFC, right? Correct. And any new extension header types that come after this, like the intermediate nodes have no business looking at it, at least from like the specification point of view, right? Yes. So, and, and I think, I don't know, like it's just a point I want to bring it, like, you know, consider this before you put this intermediate nodes to allow to send it because we are changing something, not just a new I see error code, but like how we expect the package to be treated. Does that make sense? So I, th I think you're saying that this is outside of the bounds of the normal packet processing that these errors are being sent? Yeah, I think so. Uh, like, true. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is d devices do this. And That's if they're fine. dropping I, packets, it'd be again. better to get the information than not get the information. So some, somehow we're not advocating this behavior, but we're acknowledging it exists. So it would be nice to 
be informed that they're doing that. Okay, that's fine. I'm just saying, like, consider it, like, and put some scare text around it, blah, 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 something around it, which softens it, like, saying it's not something we're sanctioning, but we know it happens. Okay, yes. But, but just to be clear here, this is purely in the case where that device has parsed so far into the packet already that it discovers a problem, right? There's no expectation here of a, of a router that doesn't do this to, to parse this far in so we can send this message back there. Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, I, th I think this is explicitly for routers with those limits. That and th then the question will be: Okay, they kick it into a slow path. Is that uh, require ICMP? So there are probably some sub issues, uh, but the error is there uh, for that particular case. So we have uh, three drafts. Version one, um, I guess, four drafts. Version one was a working group draft. In version two, and version two and three are since last IETF. Version two, we added the last option, option too big, or last error code, I should say, parameter uh, problem code seven. And in version three, this was mostly just clarifications in the security section and some edits. Uh, since last IETF, there is an implementation uh, against the Linux code. So a while back in the Linux stack, we did add limits uh, per RFC 8504 for extension headers. So we will drop, uh, for instance, if the number of hop by hop options exceeds a limit, that limit uh, happens to be eight by default. So there's uh, four of these errors are actually used in the implementation so far. Uh, the first two are basically syscuddles and those have to do with, as I said, the RFC 8504 limits. Uh, option, the third case there, extension header too big. So this is applied in two cases, one is a uh, normal extension header exceeding a byte limit, but uh, it's also convenient if padding exceeds the number of pads. So RFC 8504, for instance, uh, recommends that, there, or suggests there could be a limit of seven consecutive padding bytes. If that's exceeded, the Linux stack at least will drop the packet, so now we send uh, the extension header to a big message. So when uh, I posted this, Upstream, we got some good feedback from the net, net dev maintainer. Uh, he commented that there were other cases in this particular block of code where we we're parsing extension headers, where we were dropping packets and not sending ICMP errors. So we filled that out. In particular, one of the things that Linux does, it, it does check pad n um, data bytes to make sure they're zero. So if they're not zero, we now send uh, just a normal header field uh, parameter problem. The uh, feedback was basically pretty straightforward. We really can't take this into upstream Linux without the formal IAN assignments. So a little bit of a chicken and egg problem there. Suresh. Yeah, Suresh Krishna. So like one thing we can do, um, if the chairs like um, do a consensus call on the list, asking for an early allocation, we can actually go and get an IAN allocation right now, right? And then it, it expires in some amount of time, like I don't know, nine months or like a year or something. So you can get the code points, lock them down, and put them in the implementations, and the draft can progress in parallel. So that's like a mechanism I'm offering to you. Like the chairs just have to request me. Okay, so it. just request the assignment without it's a, worrying it's about the status request. of it. We've done a few of them before. So just ask for early allocation to the chairs. They do a call, and then we go forward. Okay, do you see any, uh, foresee any issues asking for, I think we're asking for four new codes, five new codes actually, okay. Um, uh, this question I have is uh, this ready for working group last call or what else do we need? Don't all run to your microphones. Um, so, um, how many people would be willing to review this as a part of a working group last call? One, two, three, four, five, six. Fantastic. I didn't need my threat, which I plan out to say. Um, excellent. I do remember you, so uh, this will come back to you. Yes, so I, I think um, I think we're ready to to last call this, and we'll we'll send that announcement out okay. as, uh, as soon as we can. So, right. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Okay, the next one is Bob and Gori, I think. Are you both going in the pink box? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Just be quick. So, so it's on the pink 
X this time, no bar. So Hi. I'm Corey. I'm Bob. Um, so just as a summary, as you all know, PathMTU discovery doesn't work too well on the internet. Um, we came up with this idea that it might be more reliable for the destination to send the feedback back to the source. There's a better trust relationship, um, but we understand this may not work in all places, and this is sort of what we're trying to find out. Um, changes in the current draft, um, we changed the option format to include the return value and a return flag, um, and we I think we talked about we tried this out in the previous hackathon, but we made some. We moved the the flag to the the least low order bit in the last um, two bytes, um, and we're no longer because we have a return value. We're no longer using the ICMP packet to big messages. We're just you send this in another hop by hop option back to the source or you know you send your own you can include this um, and so there are a lot of text changes relating to this uh, we also added acknowledgement section that there was a similar mechanism proposed in 1988 for ipv4 that was um, didn't go too far because they abandoned it with the current you know ipv4 path mtu discovery um, had they only known that we wouldn't be doing this today and a bunch of editorial changes. So, and here's the here's the new formats. I'm sure you've all read the draft, but you can see the return flag at the end, and we named the fields instead of value one and value two. Um, so, this is what's in the current draft. So we, we, we've implemented it, and we have something in Wireshark that works. But yeah. we need to work out if it actually works for the internet, which seems like the most important question. Um, so we need to do people to do experiments. We plan to do experiments. The first one is, do hop-by-hop -hop options really work? We really hope so. Um, what size of path MTUs have actually supported, and where are the MTU bottlenecks? And we don't know the answers to this, so that's why we're building the tool, but we need to have, do a bit of mapping for this. And what happens in practice when we try and do this when we have um, the crazy real internet? Um, well, we're going to do this work, and we would love other people to join us. So it's a plea for other people to say, this is fun. Oh, and so we did do, we had a smaller hackathon project. Um, Oli worked on his VPP router implementation. And I learned how to actually, instead of doing a Lua plugin, I learned with a lot of help how to actually modify Wireshark, you know, change the packet dash IPv6.c file. Um, and with some other help, we finally have it working, as you can maybe read this. But it now shows the option. And um, and more importantly, with the thing we couldn't do with the Lua plugin, it actually shows correctly what's after this header which the previous one didn't do. So at least that's working. And unfortunately, I know a little bit about Wireshark now. Um, so um, we want to continue the experiments. We're looking for other people to help with this. I've heard that someone is going to have some boxes that you can deploy. Um, and we would like the working group to adopt this. It's currently. Um, labeled as experimental, but I think we can still do that. And and if there's interest, we would we would like to ask the AD for an, so we can do an early IANA allocation. And the the reason for this is we want to do internet wide experimentation. You know, the experimental values are just fine for doing it on the table in hackathon, but to run it over the internet, I think we really need code points that won't conflict with other experiments. So um, we, we would like to do both of these things. So questions, comments? Hi, my name is Tim Shepard. Um, this, sometimes the MP, MTU bottleneck is in a box that does not look at the IP header. And in which case the box that is looking at the IP header and the extension headers um, 
might yeah. not even know about an MTU bottleneck between it and its next top IP layer thing. And so that, I mean, so just as long as you all understand the limitation of this. There's an easy answer to this, yes. But, <laughs> um, okay, so there's two places where you could use this. One was in an area where you're actually configuring equipment and you intend it all to work and you've just got different MTUs, then it probably will work. In the big bad internet, Maybe you need to couple it with something magic like DPL PMTUD or PMTUD or something to discover all these other facets, but it still helps. Yeah, I, I just add to that. I mean, we're not expecting this to be the magic bullet that makes this perfect. We think this is, we're trying to figure out if this is a useful tool that will help, you know, the transport will need to fall back to whatever information it can obtain, whether it's stuff it figures out or, or whether it gets feedback like this or, you know, nodes that don't support this may still do, you know, send ICMP packet, do big messages. All of that feedback needs to be dealt with. Tom Herbert. So I really love the kind of hidden bullet point there that we were going to do some experiments to see if extension headers work over the internet again. Um, be fantastic if we could have fresher data than RFC, I think it's 78, 72. Um, and not only that, if you do this experiment, and uh, I certainly would um, volunteer to help, can we make this kind of ongoing to measure the progression of, um, or the deployment of extension headers? Just hopefully the situation's improving, but right now without data, obviously we're in the dark on it. The answer to that's probably all yes, but it'd be really good to have some useful headers. And here's an example of a potentially useful header. Uh, I think Jen, Jen was next. Yes, she is. Uh, Jen Linkova, someone who actually promised to get, get you data and I'm working on it. I'm in the middle of the experiment. So yeah, we'll get some additional measurements on extension headers. And so I like this. Again, how useful it is, we'll see after we do some measurements, right? It's really early to say if you if you actually can do it internet scale, yeah, but I support this idea and I think, yeah, we need to run internet wide. Like actually get in, I don't know, is Robert here? Can we get a, when we get an option, can we get Ripe Atlas to support this? It would, it might help with the yeah, measurement, but we definitely can try something. Oh, measurement please. Uh, Joel Yegley. Um yeah, so I, um, I, I, I like the idea of experimentation. I would like to see uh, if, in fact, there are some places on the internet that you can pass hop-by-hop -hop options through. Um, I know in the case of my network that because those actually have to be sent up to the control plane, I will never see them because I can't process them. So uh, I know how that experiment is going to go. Um, but, um, you know, maybe it's possible to build a router architecture that can actually do that these days. Um, I'm not sure someone's going to write a P4 specifically to process a hop-by-hop -hop option and use half a billion transistors uh, to help make ICMP forward better, but maybe they will. I don't know. Well, I mean, the, the part of the motivation... Sure, exactly. to Joel, so part of the motivation for this is in environments where you can have links with larger MTUs to actually be able to use them, and we're hoping that that might be enough incentive. Well, I can use a link MTU of 16K right now, but uh, I don't really think I can forward packets up to my control plane at 400 gigabit rates for possibly obvious reasons. Jeff. Jeff Houston, AP. We've done a fair deal of this measurement using a combination of, of Google's online ads to get a massive number of insights, all forwarding back to a small number of servers. And this is a TCP conversation, so the servers basically send out mangled packets and look for the ACK. Um, we did this a few hundred million times November last year. The ACK rate was bad. We're getting a failure rate of these kind of packets of between 30 and 36 percent. So it's it's the it's pretty gloomy out there. There's an awful lot of dropping of extension headers. I've no idea why. 
we are looking at doing this on an ongoing basis for both UDP, for the DNS and TCP, uh, and <laughs> we'll put up a page or something and, and sort of publish it more regularly. But you know, the base level data is, for whatever reason, deployed V6 equipment out there on transit links seems to be very extension header hostile. Uh, Dave Taylor. So um, let's uh, uh, assume for the sake of argument right now that you have a path that um, does not drop packets with hot pipe options, things go through, right? Uh, my understanding of what your uh, draft talks about is that um, if you don't understand it, you just pass it on, right? And so this actually does not discover the path MTU. This discovers an upper bound on it, right? Because the hidden node may have something lower, right? So it gives you an upper bound on the path MTU. Sure. Right? Uh, Correct? It only works as a hint. Yeah, right. right it provides right, you right, an right, immediate right, hint right, of a big MTU. So it, it provides the a hint at the path MTU in the same sense as your local uh, view of your current link MTU does, right? Which is, it's an upper bound, right? Now you observe at the beginning that uh, PMTUD has problems across the internet, and yeah, you can get this information. What are you going to use it for? We have a routine in DPL PMTUD which takes IP PTB processing. This is an even easier a, one to gotcha. include as a hook. So it's a hint for use in PL MTUD. Yes. PL PMTUD. The packetization layer yeah. MTUD. It's a hint for this. So it's an optimization for that, right? Uh, I just want to caution, you can't actually rely on this and use it as a path MTU because it's not, it's just an upper bound, yeah. Sure, because it doesn't check Ethernet switches on the way either, in the middle. Okay. Um, Eric Klein, quick question. Uh, is it RFC, is this uh, 2464? I think IPv6 over Ethernet basically says if it's 1500, uh, if it's greater than 1500, uh, it should be ignored and logged. Um, there's an exception for manual whatever, of course. Do, do we want to like update that as well at some point? Oh, yeah. OK. I'd be in favor of though, it. Though I, I think IEEE also sort of says something like that, too. So, and somehow people manage to do it. I, I mean, I don't know what happens if I, if I say 9K in an MTU. And do, like, does it properly get ignored, or does it properly get honored? In an, in an RA, not necessarily. I mean, if you have manually, you can figure that, that that works based on the driver, I guess, but yeah. Okay, so I think I want to do a uh, hum to see if, if there's interest in adopting this. Um, so can the people who are in favor of making this a working group document, uh, please hum now. And those who are violently against, please hum as loud as you can now. And those who rather want to go to the social and didn't pay attention can hum now. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> that was the loudest, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I heard, you know, there's, there's some interest for this. I, you know, we'll confirm that on, on the mailing list. Uh, okay, excellent. I think, Pascal, you are up next. Which time? You have you have ten minutes on the agenda, um, but you start. Future are, time, physical we have time. A bit extra, and because I don't think we will have time for the extra talks we tried to slot in now. So you have the rest of the. So you have seventeen minutes. Oh, nice. So these are two likely <coughs> talks that Pascal will introduce. That comes from um, mostly from Six Low, right? Well, th this, this draft is actually triggered by work at IP, IP Wave and working with the IPF guy, it's, uh, guys as an uh, uh, int deer reviewer and IoT tier reviewer. I realized that um, we, we kind of needed a common framework to, understanding, to understand how we can map IPv6 to our radios so that people coming in with a particular radio could actually refer to that because there was a lot of ingenuity, I'd say, in, in the way they approach the problem. So I thought, hey, I could write a paper just specific to IP Wave, or I could just try to see if, if six men as a whole can agree on, on the various models that we could apply to, to IP, for IPv6 of our wireless. So I ended up with this draft. Next slide. OK, so um, I don't have much time. I presented that at six low, many more slides. So I just picked three. That's the chairs required. And so it's three different angles of the first of the same problem. Um, this slide is all about 
um, the expectation that uh, people doing wireless would have on, on an IPv6 neighbor discovery method. And um, well, there is quite a mismatch. So the first point which really hurts is that usually for most radios, um, the medium is not transitive. It is usually reflexive, do not necessarily. Like if A can talk to B, usually B can talk to I. It's not necessarily true, right? You have difference of power, you've got interference on one side, you've got lots of effects that may, may make it so it's not reflexive. But most of the time it is. What it is not is transitive. Like if you have um, ABC in this picture, you get the broadcast domain of ABC. A can talk to B, B can talk to C, but A cannot talk to C. So if there is a dad message or a lookup and it's just broadcasted by A on its broadcast domain, then C will not be able to respond. So that's, that's the basic thing which appears on most of the radios around. With the exception of Wi-Fi, because Wi-Fi provides a MAC level emulation of a broadcast domain by using the broadcast domain of the AP as the reference. But even if you're there, ND again fails to be uh, feeling all its promises and in particular it hurts a lot because of the the broadcast that it generates we've we've done measures recently there was the cisco live like a month ago and there was this big room for the keynote it was very well attended thank you and uh we kind of measured the network for the hour and a half of the keynote and found that ipv6 nd generated 300 messages per second during the whole show average 300 message per second broadcast over the whole thing during one hour and a half. Think about the battery of your device during that time. Okay, and that could have been completely avoided if we add the method that we have deployed at six low, by the way. And then there are a number of uh, other mismatches that, that appear. For instance, there was a great effort at uh, 802.11 uh, called FIELS, 802.11 AI, which is kind of the Tokyo station uh, use case where you've got 300 people going out of train in the station, they want instant connectivity, and there was a lot of effort at .11 to give them the re almost instant connectivity, log them all, et cetera, give them access. And then uh, if, you know, if you've read the uh, Jen's draft, you realize that um, within a number of seconds, a good number of them still don't get IPv6 connectivity. Hopefully they do IPv4. But for IPv6, it's another game. So um, this is just one example, but there's also all the sensitivity to dust attacks, etc. So ND is not historic, but it is certainly archaic. So that's that's one angle, applying just ND to most of the radios around. Now, this draft is not specifically about ND, it's about more like what kind of models do we want to apply, where's the link, where's the subnet, what kind of subnet do you want to build, is the subnet bigger than the link, is the link bigger than the subnet, is it a mountain link subnet, all those games. So we try to model that and you know, just give a name to the different approaches. An interesting one is what is your link, right? IPv6 says the link is the medium for communication between two devices, well that's fine. What do you mean by medium? Is it a layer two medium, is it a layer one medium. If you look at your layer one medium, that's my broadcast domain. On my broadcast domain, I can talk, but I mean, who can I talk to? Can I establish a point-to-point -point link, right? Um, if, if I do that, if I start my radio in the morning and I do that on an IPv6 link local address and I walk all day with my radio on, do I consider that the dad I did in the morning is still valid uh, two hours later when I crossed half of the world? Probably not. So you realize that uh, a domain on which I can assert the uniqueness of my link local address is probably a peer that I'm talking to at the link layer, meaning that a link is probably a, a pair of devices communicating with one another that when they start, assert that each other's address is unique from each other's perspective. And that's how six low modeled actually the radio domain. Doesn't mean that the subnet is that. For instance, here, I just have one of the possible model, which is hub and spoke whereby the router in the middle can uh, use the same prefix to talk, can, prefix B, you know, column 64, can be used for A and C to form addresses, and they can all talk together as long as B exposes the prefix as not on link and relays packet between A and C. So the model that you're used to in, in uh, BSS, which is the Wi-Fi equivalent of this, can completely apply in exactly the same fashion at layer three. If you don't have a layer two, BSS, we can do it at layer three, thank you. Exactly the same model. And that's what we did at six low. We just reproduced what is known to work well uh, in dot 11 yeah, uh, infrastructure mode, and we just replicated that at layer three. Uh, last but not least angle of this discussion is, 
Can we do everything that we want already with the method we have at layer three? Not exactly. There are, even for IP wave, even based on everything we have at six low, there are still things which could be improved. Six low mostly considered devices that don't really move a lot. And well, I did code that in, in our routers like 15 years ago, I realized that the, if I had to tweak ND to get a mobile router to work. And the reason is, uh, for instance, ND doesn't tell you if you have to match the prefix. Well, it tells you you don't. I have to match the prefix that the router gives away and the source address that you use. So if, if you're moving with your radio on and you get arrays as you go, and you form addresses with all those prefixes that you hear as you go, and then you tr use any of the addresses that you formed to, uh, uh, you, with any of the routers that you've heard about, there's a good chance that the router that you use is gone, or doesn't know the prefix that you're using and will filter it out. So if, you, if you're mobile and, and you don't even have a, a link layer method to detect the routers you have around, which is the case of OCB for 11, then you probably want to have new things that you do, including matching the address with the router. I get this PIO from that router, I'm using this source address, I'm using that router. It's unusual for ND, it's not the right thing maybe in some environments, it's, it's pretty much the thing you have to do if you do IP mobile IP. And, and part of that game is also how you manage your default router list. Because maybe this router uses the array interval and, and speaks every 100 milliseconds with a new array. That's very good as a layer three beacon. That's how you do the dot 11 beacon. But so this other router speaks every minute, but I just heard about it. So which one should I use? The one that speaks every minute, but I just heard, or the one that t tells me it's gonna beak on every 100 milliseconds. That's a sort of logic that you have to invent as you go. And I did my own like in, in, in our routers long ago when I did those experiments, but there is no standard for doing this. I probably did the wrong thing, it appeared to work. But if we want to enable m mobile things like the scars of our OCB, then we'll have to reconsider those things. So the array interval that we have in mobile IP is the beginning of that story that emulates the uh, beacon, but then how you, you manage your care of address and match it with the router, this is not described anywhere. So that's pretty much what I had on this slide. So if you want more slides, I present them in six low, just download them from six low. If you want more time next time, I can go on you know, all the subnet models and discuss that, otherwise there's a draft. Um, but the question to the room is, is our interest in six men to, to document all those possibilities and, and those things, right? Um, the, the draft is published, I can leave it like that, I can extend it, there are tons of things I could write in there. Um, is our interest? So, I mean, in the past we have, we have worked on, you know, ND dad issues, we had the efficient ND work, which, uh, which did strand, but I, I do wonder if, if the world has moved on that, uh, you know. This one is, this one is more, um, it's not on a track, it's more informational, like there are things, right? There, are, right. there is how you could play with your radio, right. there is how you could map ND. With, with traditional ND you can do this, with uh, six loop and ND you can do that, and there is what you still cannot do, kind of. It's, it's more this level. Right. Uh, if you want to solve anything, it's, I don't expect it to be this draft. Right, right. No, so I wanted to see if, if you know, is there, is there some interest in, in restarting work in this area? Lorenzo? Lorenzo Clevey, I've read the draft uh, for once. I, um, this draft is, is sort of like not even almost about restarting work. I think it's, um, there's uh, a good summary of things that have been done in the past and in different link layers and, and what the underlying semantics of the links are and what you can do with them. Uh, it's, um, it, it's heavily biased towards what was done already and it's sort of a, a little bit biased against like classic ND. There's a few sort of like, we recommend this and we recommend that, which doesn't really belong in informational. But I think as a document itself, it's actually useful to, because it, it presents, it, it's relatively neutral and it presents like a lot of the, the trade-offs that were made. Um, but it, it, I don't know that it's something that the, we need to work on. It's sort of like, it's almost complete as is, right? I, I wonder if it just should be, you know, published as an IC or something. It's a useful document for sure, but I, I don't think that it's kicking off work if we, it seems like mostly complete already. I hope it's gonna help the work at IP Wave because that was the initial goal, but I thought publishing it at IP Wave was too limited, no point of doing that. Yeah, yeah and I mean, this is just to introduce the work and we'll continue on the, on the mailing list. <coughs> yep.
one more. Uh, so this one is not a six-man draft, but I don't know where it should it should live. Uh, actually, we asked the question at six low, and the, the sense of the room and of the AD, if I don't if I remember well, was that it would be better at six at six man than six low. So this is the logical continuation of the work that happened at six low. The work that happened at six low was really looking at the wireless side, trying to optimize the multicast. Um, but we realized that probably there are some of those aspects that we could actually port it to a more general usage. So what do we try to address here? The first thing we try to address is the scalability of an IPv6 subnet. And if you rely on Mac level emulation of a broadcast domain over a large fabric, well, that, that's fine on a limited Ethernet switch fabric. If you have a lot of wireless edge, it already starts to work. If you distribute your layer two fabric over layer three in multiple data centers, that really hurts a lot. What we do in those networks is we build overlays and we want to resolve the other hand uh, of the tunnel. We don't want to have to broadcast anything. It happens that today with our confabrics, we still do have to do broadcasts because there are cases where we don't resolve and that really hurts. So what we would like to do is do all our resolution through a mapping server, most of them in pure unicast and avoid the, the broadcast. So today, my company sells solution based on Lisp to do that. So we, we have this map server, my, my resolver, and you can query it with Lisp. And if you do that, then you can save a lookup. You can save a broadcast on your fabric. But what we don't have is a generic way of doing that through the most logical way, which is neighbor discovery. So the idea behind this draft is pretty much to say, hey, we already have this in six low, this central registrar where we list all the addresses in the, in the network that were registered. That's how we do that over multiple uh, routers in, in a big fabric. Why don't we just look at this thing using the same ND methods? So you could use, uh, so the draft proposes just an NS lookup, but you send it to Nikas to this guy. It's the first thing you can do. Or if, if it's actually not on your broadcast link, like if you're on a wireless Wi-Fi and we do this backbone router game and the proxy, which is actually recommended by Wi-Fi, then you will have a, a, mech, a packet that goes multiple hops because you have to go to the router and it's different links. You have a backbone link, which is represented on the right here by this ethernet backbone, and you have the, the wireless link, and there are two different links, like it's an, ethan, an heterogeneous mounting subnet. So if you live in a world like this, then the, the database is not on, on your link. It's on, on the broadcast domain, on the Ethernet, meaning that you need a packet which goes multiple hops, which is what six law has provided anyway. So what the draft does mostly is take the six, six law signaling, which can go multiple hop, which is called DARDAC, duplicate address request, duplicate address uh, confirm, and extend it to do a lookup. So now we have a new code, it's same ICMP code, right? We don't uh, same ICMP type. We, we don't go be able to use a new ICMP type, but we have code and subcode in there. And so we just take in that space and allow this multi hub message to be a lookup as opposed to just a, a dead request. That's pretty much what the, the message does. Yeah. Right. Two minutes. Okay, one, one on this slide, one on the next. So this is just giving you an example. So all, all the six low drafts basically which talk about the backbone are really meant to, to coexist. It doesn't mean that you have to have either the broadcast games, the old ND or, or six low ND. You can have both at the same time. It's really meant to coexist. Now here is what would happen in the fierce use case, you no know, A2.11AI, where all those hundreds of people jump out of the train. So any of those guys would basically send an RS to, to locate the router. It's, it's supposed to be a multicast, but since the access point is a router and the access point is the one that does a real broadcast, it just will not do that because it's a router. So it will just intercept the RS and the RS will never be broadcasted on the, on the wireless uh, network. Then it will answer unicast array, so that's immediate. And he will, the, so the, now the 6LN can auto conf on the trust as many as it likes and it registers them to the 6LBR, which means that we pre-populate the ND cache. That's the important thing, right? We pre-populate the ND cache. So now, if, um, if, if there is, uh, uh, this is the registration. So you register to the router, the register writes it down on the central registry. And now we can do optimistic that pretty much that's what's happening here. So um, 
the, the, the host sent, well, it's on behalf because as a proxy, send, send an RS uh, to the router without SLIO because that's so bad. Uh, the router looks, wants to answer Unica, so it sends a, an NS, uh, NA, and, and that's how the router gets populated. And now in optimistic mode, the IPv6 packets can start right over, so you don't have any delay, just a few exchanges and there you go. You can start exchanging your data. So that, that's pretty much what we can do in IPv6 to finish what the dot eleven AI group does group started at eight to dot eleven. Yep. And that's pretty much my talk. So we put the central registrar that we already have anyway. We give an ND interface to it so that any host can register to it. And the most most hosts register to it, the less broadcast you will get uh, doing lookup. That's pretty much what you have. Super. Thank you, Pascal. And uh, the blue sheets, please. And we're done for today, but we'll reconvene on Thursday afternoon in the neighboring room. I hope to see you all there. Yes, uh, but please follow up on the mailing list. We're, we're out of time, so. <clears throat> I'm <laughs> going